My story this morning when Joe asked me to talk about my faith, um, there isn't a great conversion that happened to me, but it's been kind of like, like boiling a frog with Jesus. He's been in part of my life, my whole life, and he's been there watching and giving me guidance. So I'll tell you a few stories, and hopefully you'll um, relate to them yourselves, because anything that's happened to me has happened to all you guys. I, I just know it has. So basically, it's not a singular conversion. Like some people say, I had a conversion. This is what changed my life. Um, my life's been uh, evolving with my faith. So my parents, Jim and Edith, come from strong Catholic families. These are 87 and 89 year old folks. They were hardworking German people of the greatest generation. Um, they'd lived through World War II. Um, pretty typical folks. Um, I was visiting with my mom recently, and she told me, she said, the only thing I asked of your dad is that I wanted to have 10 kids. <laughs> and I thought about that, and I thought, wow. I wonder what Brenda, if she'd asked me that in 1984, <laughs> I'd have said, what? Well, okay. But, you know, we were just playing cards and visiting with them, and and, I, and on their 10th anniversary, they had six children at the table, and she was pregnant with me, eight months pregnant. So, I mean, think about that generation that raised us, our parents. That's the way they lived. They, they, they wanted children. They accepted what God gave them, and they lived life faithfully. They worked hard. They were, just like Joe said, they're humble people. And uh, they've been blessed with 67 years of marriage. So... You know, at that point, you look back and you say, thank you, Jesus, for giving me great parents like this. What great examples. So there again, it's a small conversion, but he said, you know what? You deserve good parents. So I grew up a couple blocks from the Catholic Church. We had an Irish priest. From as early as I can remember, it was like the mid-1980s when I left to move to Sioux Falls. So he was a priest in Humboldt for probably 40 years. And he was strict. <laughs> He was fun. I mean, looking back, we started serving Mass in second grade. And back then, by the time you got to be an eighth grader, you are supposed to be done. Just like you're supposed to be done doing dishes at home when you're in eighth grade. But he took us aside and he said, me and a couple buddies, and he said, you guys are going to serve Mass till I tell you you're done. <laughs> <laughs> he was getting older and he needed help. And we were fairly good sized guys and he needed our arms to help him up and down the altar and to go to funerals, um, to go to the cemetery, which was a mile from the church. He'd throw us the keys to the Lincoln Continental and we were in hog heaven. We got to drive the Continental out to the cemetery. So Father Coyne was his name and he, he loved to, to homilize. And his, his homilies started with a stepladder. We'd go behind the altar, we'd come out, we'd put a stepladder in front of the altar and a slate of uh, chalkboard He'd pull the chalk out, and he would talk for 50 minutes every Saturday night. <laughs> he was famous for it, but you learned a lot from this man. So, you know, you look back and you think, man, that guy was, he was, you know. But he, he uh, brought all these things to us. And serving Mass all those years, what you get is the, the smells and the sights and the sounds. And you interact with people. And you do a lot, of, um, a lot of funerals. I bet I served a funeral once a month growing up. And weddings, and of course, every first communion. And back then, confirmations were like every four years. I mean, it's just the way we did it. But as an altar server, you really get exposed to your faith. You're right up there. You're watching the priest. You're, you know, it just, that was a, a great blessing. And Jesus was there making sure I get experience, making sure I'm exposed making sure he's embedding in me my faith. So as we grew up in Humboldt, I was the youngest of seven. And we had a big extended family, a lot of farmers. So when the, you know, in the 60s and 70s, the farmers weren't like they are now. They were hands-on. Typically, they farmed a couple quarters maybe. But they had smaller equipment, so the young kids, you know, 6th, 7th, and 8th grade boys were perfect help for the farm. 
So in the summertime, we would go live with our uncles and, and our cousins, and it wasn't it was it was a good experience. It was fun. The the cousins were our age, and we played a lot together, but we worked a lot together. So every night during the summer, as I lived with my aunt and uncle, we would finish the day with a rosary, and we'd sit outside on the porch as the sun set, and great memories. And Junior Deanna, one of the two, would start the rosary. And as a sixth or seventh grader and the cousins, they'd call you out. Third mystery, Bob, it's your mystery. What is it? <laughs> Hopefully it's never the first one because you got to remember the, which, uh, <laughs> which mysteries of the day. <laughs> but it was constant exposure. And it was, you know, you have to lead a decade of the rosary. How many kids today, sixth and seventh grade, are comfortable leading a decade of the rosary? Because we don't say it enough with them. But it was my exposure. And through the years, the rosary was <clears throat> a very big and important part of my life. And if you stop and think about it as Catholic men, how often do you say a Hail Mary? How often do you call on the Blessed Mother? You should be at least 53 times a day <laughs> if you're going to say a rosary a day. Most of us are probably more than that. It just should roll off your tongue. And it just gave me a great respect for the Blessed Mother and the great prayer. Um, I was recently doing a focus couple for Holy Spirit, and they're a young couple. One, it was a mixed faith, and we were talking, and I said, do you just cringe at a, at a prayer service for a funeral when they pull out the rosary? And the young man said, what's a rosary? And I thought, oh boy, <laughs> I can't believe you haven't, you're, how old we haven't been exposed to a rosary. Well, he said, I haven't gone to many prayer services. So I said, well, I get it. So we had a great talk about it. And we talked about the rosary and why you do it, how it's a great meditation. And, you know, I just hope that as he goes through his married life, he learns the rosary and uses it. So my, my uncle passed away a little early. Um, and I still remember at his funeral, his daughter was eulogizing her father. And she said, you know, as we prepared for the funeral, I was visiting with my mom, and Deanna said, I probably washed hundreds of rosaries in the pockets, because Junior always had a rosary in his pocket. And then she said, it just, she mentioned how important, he's a fourth degree knight. She mentioned how important the rosary was to him. And as I recalled, I thought, you know, he has, every tractor he had in the ashtray had a rosary. Every truck he had in the ashtray, there's a rosary. None of us are smokers, obviously. Combine, rosary. <laughs> I'd be out there running his tractor, you know, thinking. And I'd say the rosary because it's, it's like, okay, there's a rosary. Better say a rosary while we got it. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, it's, it's just a natural for a Catholic boy to, to have that opportunity. And there again, you know, you stop and think about Jesus and conversions. He's back there. As I'm a 6th, 7th, and 8th grade boy operating farm equipment, and he's telling me, turn the radio off, say a rosary, meditate, think. So, you know, you don't think about that till, till the funeral, unfortunately. But anyway, um, the rosary is a great, great prayer and a great meditation. Don't be afraid to use it. Look at that young couple. <laughs> huh? There we go. I met Brenda, she's the love of my life, in 1983. We dated for a year and we married in October of 84. She's been my greatest blessing. We share our faith beliefs and she's been our family role model from day one. We got four daughters, Amy, Sarah, Rebecca, and Morgan. Three grandkids and expecting four and five in October and February. I guess the biggest thing I can emphasize, and we all know this, um, parenthood is the greatest blessing you'll ever get as a married couple and that will bring you to your knees in times of joy and times of sorrow. And throughout my 37 years of marriage, he's been there and he's helped us and he's guided me as life throws you curveballs. Um, so each child awakens a parent in their own way. My relationship with Jesus was really awakened when Becky, as Joe mentioned, told me she was a senior at USD, psych major, 
She said, Dad, I'm going to go to work for Focus. I said, I've heard of Focus, but what do you do when you work for Focus? She said, well, I have to fundraise my salary. Now I started paying attention. <laughs> I said, oh boy. So watching that process that summer of her meeting with some of you, and thank you, by the way, and explaining what she wanted to do and explaining how her faith in the Catholic religion and in Jesus Christ and her relationship with Jesus Christ was going to support her. And it was amazing. She went up to UND, spent four years. I sat in on a couple of her classes with her, her sessions. I met several of her students. Those kids have a relationship with Jesus Christ that we all should. They just, it's really important. And it really taught me that our Catholic community will support you if you need it. And this wasn't a, can you support me? I'm about to go live on the streets. She met and said, just whatever you can do. And the support was unbelievable. Unbelievable. It's just these kids, you know, it's hard work for them to do it. But she led missions all over the world. She went to India. She went to uh, the Holy Land. She's been to Ireland. She's, you know, and she's, she's led a lot of, lot of students down the right path. And she was fortunate enough to get blessed. And she got to meet our Pope. It's, this is within 30 days of your wedding. If you go attend Mass, you get to have a face-to-face -face meeting. So Jesus blessed her with a young Catholic man, Hunter, and he's as strong as she is in her faith. And let me tell you, that brings a lot of gratefulness. <clears throat> Except for they live in Bismarck. But <laughs> <laughs> she's going to bring us our second grandson in a month, and I'm really looking forward to it. But Jesus guided her through those five years and provided, and it was just a true blessing. So, I mean, it was, it was really interesting. She taught me, she said, you know, do you think you're doing everything you can when you just go to Mass once a week for an hour? And I'm like, well. <laughs> and she said, you know, Dad, you've got to work on this. You've got you to gotta give Jesus time. You've got to pray more at home. You've got to go to Mass more than, you'll find that your daily Mass means more than your weekend Mass. It's more intimate. You're more purposeful when you go. She said, it's really important to go not just to Mass every day, which none of us, it's tough to get to every day. I try and get there a couple times a week, maybe three times a week. But she said, it doesn't take much to have a holy hour every day. And she has a room in her house with a, with a kneeler and candles. And it's very nice because she said, I can go there to pray uninterrupted. There's no TVs, there's, it's just, and she said, you need to do this. Once in a while, you need to decompress and spend time. So she taught me, you know, to basically put a little more effort into your faith life. You're not going to become a professional at whatever you're doing at one hour a week or one half of 1% of your time. So it was a great gift that Jesus gave me with my daughters, but also with the fact that he exposed me to focus. And if you guys, it's not an advertisement for focus, but I'm just telling you, if a young kid asks you to support them, please do. It's a great organization. So I started attending daily mass a couple times a week and Eucharistic Adoration, Father Monsignor Androsco, back in 2002 when we built the addition of the church, he insisted that we have an adoration chapel. That's another great way to spend an hour a week. And I've been going since 2002 to that and just have really enjoyed that Wednesday night at nine o'clock. Um, for 20 years, I was with one other young lady um, and she recently went to eight o'clock because it just got to be too much but we developed a good friendship and we try not to visit too long when you're in <laughs> when you're in the adoration chapel but we do share and we do pray together and again you know if you want to have a strong relationship give jesus back a little bit of time and spend more than one half of one percent of your time on that relationship so I'm the youngest of seven, and growing up, we prayed daily, just like most of you probably did growing up in the 60s and 70s. We never missed Mass and Holy Days of Obligation, 
And I had a sister who was severely handicapped. She was the fourth, fourth born. Again, mom wanted 10 kids. Number four was severely handicapped. I'm number seven, and she had number eight. <laughs> um, that just shows you how, how strong these, the faith of these people were. Um, so she had cerebral palsy, and she couldn't speak. And the doctors told her when she was born, told my parents, to put her in an institution. She's going to be way too hard for you to handle with four kids and move on with your life. Well, my parents didn't do that. They brought her home, added more kids to the mix. But throughout the years, we helped her. And having a special needs kid, person, exposure to your family just really awakens you. If you really pay attention, she couldn't speak. She couldn't help herself. She had, you know, all kinds of, you know, she was spastic, but yet we would put her in a wheelchair and bring her to church. The whole congregation would watch as we rolled their daughter, our sister up, second to the front row, and she would draw the stairs, you know, and we would just pass it off. But can you imagine living your life every time you were thirsty, hoping someone would notice and giving you a drink of water? If you wanted to watch TV, you would hope they picked the right channel. She grew up with four brothers. <laughs> she got to drink when we had a drink. And she ate when we, after we ate and we thought about her. I'm not saying it was cruel. That's just the, that's the burden that, that Christ put on her. And she just, she took it. She, she was happy. She smiled at you. And it just, you think to yourself now when she's gone. She's been gone since 2005. But I looked back and I said, wow, Jesus must have been by her. We put her to bed at 7.30. She didn't say, I'm tired. She didn't say, I want to go to bed. It's 7.30. We're putting her to bed. We got things to do. I mean, imagine that. And that's what special needs people bring to families um, is they just awaken you. So the biggest thing that affected me, one of the biggest things, she had a feeding tube. And the surgeon was fixing her feeding tube late in her life. And when he was doing that, he, he found that she had severe gallbladder uh, infection. And I've had my gallbladder taken out. I know how painful that is. He said, she must have had this for a year. But yet she couldn't speak, and she wouldn't say anything. So imagine the pain that poor woman went through. 47 years she lived, and she let pe everyone else had control of her life. So <clears throat> when she died, I just, you know, I thought, it's just amazing. I said, I met a lot of good people in my life. Most have taught me, either in class or by example, but none can make you stop and think like Connie. And she never spoke a single word your entire life. So I think God gave us Connie to give us an example how to live a pure life. Just follow his footsteps and listen to his word. She did receive communion. Um, she could communicate by looking left or right. So we were able to get her to a level where we had a priest who was comfortable enough giving her communion. So she did receive that, and I know it meant a lot to her. I just can't help but think that throughout her life, Connie was constantly um, getting her hand held by Jesus. How else would you live through that? It's just... So it had a, a profound impact on me. Okay, so I'm, as I mentioned, I'm the youngest, so I get a lot of advice. I did. I still do. Um, unsolicited, usually, but siblings are that. So, you know, most of the time, that stuff goes in one ear and out the other. But I did bond pretty closely with my brothers. We hunted a lot, we fished a lot, and we worked a lot. We worked a lot together. So in February 2011, most of you knew Jim. He got the bad news. He got the bad news, terrible news. He had terminal brain cancer. It's news like that. You just can't believe it to experience it, and you guys have all experienced it more than likely. His message to us is, we're all gonna die someday. So this is okay. He said, this is a blessing for me, because now I can focus on being a warrior for our faith and put the other day-to-day -day things on the back burner. He said, I need to focus on my faith, and so do you. And he said, my time is limited, but 
But you know what? Yours might be too. So he, we had family rosaries. He wrote blogs. Um, as I thought through this, I have a book at home from Shutterfly, which is a printout of all his blogs that he had when he was going through it. It's awesome. You guys should read that every day. But he led by example, and uh, when he had a chance to tell his nieces and nephews about how important it is for the Catholic faith to be kept on, he did. And it, it greatly affected these, the, the kids of our family. I think they, they listened, and I know Rebecca did. So his, you know, he, it wasn't a new statement, but he said our faith is a generation away from being lost. So it's our duty to love and respect it. So he called his terminal diagnosis a gift. So I guess you can look at it a lot of ways. As much as I miss him, I can also see it as a gift because it embedded me a deeper connection to the Blessed Mother Mary and the power of her intercession. I've always felt comfortable praying to Mary. And Jim was a good example. Priests, we'll talk about priests just a little bit because again, this is, these aren't things that people haven't had happen to them, so I just hope that, if nothing else, you look back and say, yeah, that is the priest that I had a good relationship with, or that is some of the things that made my faith stronger. So we had Father Monsignor Drosco when we first got married at Holy Spirit. He had a parish renewal weekend, and we went, and he, got to, he gave some pretty good talks, but one of the most profound statements he made was to get to know your priest. He said, give them more than a handshake after Mass. They need you as much as you need them. So get to know them, and you will have a lot better experience with your faith. So when Father Morgan came to Holy Spirit as a newly ordained priest, I was fortunate to... This, I was going to get a different picture, but... <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> to have, build a relationship with Father Morgan. And I think, you know, Father Androsco always said, he, you know, we had a really good relationship with him. I want to come out and have chicken at your house. I said, come on out, bring Father Morgan. Father Morgan comes out. He's a young associate priest. He's just, he just connected with my kids. My daughter, Sarah, like, she was competitive. Basketball hoop out in the driveway. We're done. We're having maybe a glass of wine after dinner. Father Morgan says, you play basketball, Sarah? She says, I do. Let's go play a game of horse. And they went out in the driveway and played basketball for an hour. She still talks about that. And she still, when she sees Father Morgan, thinks about playing basketball with the priest. Not just the priest, with Father Morgan. So thank you, Father Morgan, for that relationship. So he came back to Holy Spirit and was pastor there for 10 years. And we had a lot of good conversations. He gave me a lot of mentoring and their meaningful relationship with my kids. So our first wedding, Sarah's, came at a very difficult time. Brother Jim died on Monday. The wedding was on Friday. <laughs> and so we were, it was an emotional roller coaster. But Father Morgan came through with a very heartfelt and meaningful homily at the wedding. And you can't, you just, you just can't believe how much, how many people after that wedding said, you really connect with Father Morgan. He really gave a good homily. And I said, he does it all the time. <laughs> so anyway, his relationship with Becky was solid, and the only real demand that she wanted for her wedding was for Father Morgan to conduct the ceremony. And now my daughter Morgan's getting married next year, and again, she wants Father Morgan. So three of my four kids will get married by the same priest, God willing, if it all works out. Last fall, we were struck with another terminal disease, and our sister-in-law was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. Once again, Father Morgan, we need your help. He came to our support. He offered the confession and last blessing to my sister-in-law. She was not a member of any of the parishes. She was Catholic, had fallen away. But he graciously and willingly and enthusiastically performed the last sacraments and helped us with her funeral. We couldn't have the funeral in the church because she wasn't a member, but through Deacon Bill and Father, we were able to have a very nice prayer service and funeral. 
service at George Boom. So thank you. So once again, Jesus is there helping me by having a relationship with a priest, helping my family by providing that support, a prayerful boost when we need it. Thank you, Father Morgan. My opportunities in business have been wonderful, and my faith called upon me more than once. Business owners are presented lots of opportunities to make choices, good choices and bad choices. The decisions that get made have an effect that is lasting and permanent. Most of the time, we don't give much thought to the impact of our actions, but our employees are watching us, and they're relying on us to make good decisions, act in a professional manner, and represent the group in a positive light. I am comforted by the belief that Jesus Christ is at hand in how my business experiences successes and failures. I'm also hopeful that he'll be forgiving to all of us who lack the courage or miss the opportunity to honor him as we conduct ourselves in our community, in our business. Jesus has guided us and gives us strength to be better Catholic men at our place of business. How often do we recognize that? How often do, how often do we speak up when we're disagreeing with something that's going on, but we keep quiet because we don't want to get involved with it? Um, he's blessed me with a good, good 30 years. My partner Tom's here. Um, he's a Lutheran, but he's okay. We won't make him mask up or anything. <laughs> But it's been a great 30 years, and not everybody gets that. Not everybody gets 30 years of partnership where you get along and where you aren't at each other's throats for the whole time. So hopefully all of you are having that same experience, or at least you recognize when things go well, who's helping you with that experience. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is social distancing in, our, in this pandemic. We've conditioned ourselves to be to this really quick. Think about how you acted in February and how you acted in March. And I miss the handshakes and the shared meals and the personal interaction that we have to, we've had to modify. We don't get to do this much anymore. And our faith practice has been moderate, modified. It begs the question, have we been sac uh, social distancing with our faith? How long? I mean. Have you kept Jesus six feet away in everything you're doing and how you're practicing your business, how you're raising your kids, how you're attending church? How you're, you know, it just, it's been, it's been a try. And more than I miss the meals and handshakes, I miss the mass as soon as it stopped. I just, we want it back. And let's not keep him at a safe distance and let's not put masks on when we're talking about Jesus. Um, we choose to celebrate Mass only when it con conditions are just right. And we take prayer after we have all the other things done in the day. I just have to say thank you, Jesus, for your patience and understanding of us. And please help us through this pandemic. Because the last thing you should social distance from is your faith. It's a time where we need to be tighter, closer. Um, I thank you.